as I said earlier, we went from one really great talk to another. We've got Rob up here who's going to be talking about nanofabrication, and this is going to be a wonderful talk, so please welcome him to the Tour Camp stage. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, if you were at Tour Camp a couple of years ago, um, you would have seen me on the stage talking about this crazy ancient microscope that I inherited. Uh, it's a scanning electron microscope that was made in the 1980s. Uh, it was right around 1980. Um, I was alive, but I was not that old in 1980. Uh, it uh, had a lot of problems. I talked about all the crazy problems that I had to go through to get this thing working again. Uh, and immediately after tour camp, it ran into another really difficult problem. And so that's what I want to tell you about, uh, which is this kind of scope is... Uh, can I just see a show of hands? Who here has any experience at all on scanning electron microscopy? See, this is why I love tour camp. My God. <laughs> And it's not just people in my hackerspace who have played with this scope. I mean, like, there's, there's people out here. Um, so uh, hands up if you've used a thermionic. Uh, do, hands up if you know what a thermionic is. Maybe we'll start there. Okay, okay, I'll get into the differences here. Uh, if you have played with a scope in, in, in school, at college, uh, whatever, the most, by far the most common kind of electron emitter is a thermionic emitter. It's basically a light bulb. Uh, you have a little uh, loop of tungsten wire. You pass a current through it, and it emits photons and electrons. Uh, this scope is a different kind, uses a different kind of technology called uh, an FEG. Uh, an FEG is a field emission electron gun. So in your thermionic, this is, represents a little loop of tungsten, just like a filament in a light bulb. That's, that's, the, that's a really common kind. Pass a current, it makes a beam of electrons. It makes a cloud of electrons. You use electromagnetics to form it into a beam and, and accelerate it. Uh, but the tighter you can get this little hairpin, the smaller you can make the effective spot. So there are other kinds of technologies that will make tighter and tighter spots. Uh, another kind of technology is a, a Lab 6, a lanthanum hexaboride crystal, where you're actually using the edge of a crystal that was grown to, uh, to emit electrons. Uh, and then down at the other end here, we get the FEG. The FEG is a single p crystal of tungsten that has been etched to be atomically thin at the end to provide the smallest possible point and therefore the greatest possible magnification. So the, like the difference in technology here is vast. Like this, I take a piece of you know, a 0.1 millimeter tungsten, I bend it in a loop, I spot weld it onto an emitter and I'm good. This is a $5,000 piece of machined tungsten. Uh, so uh, my challenge after tour camp was uh, my emitter died. So what am I going to do now with this uh, thing that I've sunk a year into? And uh, well, you know, this is uh, this is what the emitter module looks like when you removed it from the scope. This was a, a very heart-rending exercise because I knew that as soon as I cracked the uh, the copper seal that holds this thing in place. Um, I was in for a very expensive repair if I couldn't do it myself. So, uh, so, so this thing, like to give you a sense of scale, it's about the size of this micro mic microphone. Uh, the, uh, the tip here is, uh, uh, it's very smoothly polished. Uh, uh, it's an anode. Uh, it's, um, in, the, in, the, in the thermionic, uh, it's, uh, it's called the venelt. Uh, you have, uh, here, let me just go back for a second. You have, all of these basically work in the same kind of principle. You have, something that makes electrons happen, and then you have this venelt, this uh, surrounding uh, piece, and there's a high voltage potential between the two. This whole thing is in a vacuum, and the, an acceleration happens between these two points, so the electrons move down the column. And you know, when I say column, the column is actually quite tall. In here, the FEG is up here at the top, so there's a little tiny point, uh, for an FEG, you need to be at ultra-high vacuum. So this is a 10 to the minus 9 tour, which is very difficult to uh, achieve. I'm not going to get into all of that. That was the last talk. This talk is about how, how, what, what the hell do you do when the thing is broken. Um, so you have your electrons are emitted here. They're accelerated down a tube. There are various electromagnetic uh, coils that steer and focus the beam. Your uh, sample is down here. The electrons hit the sample, they reflect off into sensors, and then that's what, that's what turns into your picture. So what I had to do first was rip this thing out. So uh, you've got, this is all porcelain. This is a razor sharp edge that uh, is a knife edge that's gonna dig into a copper gasket. Uh, that is the only thing that's strong enough to withstand uh, the atmospheric pressure to keep you at ultra high vacuum. 
the whole thing, the whole system has to be baked to remove um, the water vapor and strain, extraneous air molecules out of the system. It's, it's really difficult to, to get the vacuum back once you've cracked this. So once, once it was open, like, well, I, you know, I got nothing to lose now. Uh, let's keep digging. Let's, let's see what's inside of it. So if I take the top of the vent out off, so if I unscrew this thing, what you end up with is this. So this is a little loop of tungsten wire that's a tenth of a millimeter thick. And on top of it is this little tiny stick here. And on top of that, there's a little tiny point. And that point is one or two atoms of tungsten thick if it were a good emitter. This one is a broken emitter. Uh, so just to give you a sense of scale, that's how big it is. We've got eight millimeters across. We've got a tenth of a millimeter here. We've got one millimeter here. And then it goes down to, uh, well, it goes down to 500 picometers on the end of that. Yeah, so half a nanometer is what we're trying to go for. Uh, I called a couple of different places saying, hi, will you take pity on me? I really need one of these modules. They, they don't really make cold cathode FEGs anymore. They're kind of finicky, and it's a lot easier to use the Lab 6s uh, because generally you're not going down to 600,000 X magnification on a day-to-day -day kind of basis, uh, and you want your grad students to be able to just turn the machine on and do the thing, right? So Lab 6 will get you down to you know 50, maybe even 100,000 X, which is more than enough for most people's application, and it's not as finicky. But me, I, like I, I, I want to you know, push it as far as I could possibly go. So of course I want to manufacture one of these things. No one would talk to me. No one, like they thought I was a terrorist because I was not you know, attached to a university. Like, I don't know. It was very difficult to convince people that yes, I am a good person and I just want to fix my microscope. So <laughs> I was kind of on my own. So the first thing I had to learn how to do was spot weld tungsten wire. And this was my first attempt. I needed a spot welder, so I made a spot welder. We <laughs> ripped a microwave oven transformer out of a, of a microwave. Uh, I had some help uh, uh, from my shop mates. Uh, this used to be thousands of windings of copper, and we chiseled the thing out of there and put in some double aught uh, copper. Uh, so this became a step-down transformer. Instead of stepping up to you know, 3,000 volts, it steps down to about a volt at you know, many, many, many amps. And we stuck a you know, foot switch on it. Uh, it comes out here to uh, a couple of tungsten electrodes. And I figured, OK, I'll clamp my thing in there, and I'll hit it, and we'll see what happens. So this is a magnification of those two tungsten electrodes coming together. And then this is the loop of wire, and this is the little tiny one millimeter piece. And that's an infrared, and you could see. You know, okay, I'm spot welding tungsten, great. Well, what I was really doing, though, was I was making a whole lot of tungsten oxide and destroying uh, the piece that I was trying to uh, weld. So I, I couldn't even start at a tenth of a millimeter. It was way too small. Like, that's like, you know, human hair-ish, right, you know? So this is uh, a quarter of a millimeter because I thought I would start easy, you know, start with something I can at least see. And uh, I couldn't do it. Uh, it was terrible. Uh, forms a very brittle weld. This is the original emitter for, for scale. So you can see it's twice as thick. Uh, I, uh, after the weld, the, uh, yeah, the tungsten would just break. Uh, I tried using shield gas because the part of the tungsten oxide was, of course, it's getting very hot and the tungsten is reacting with oxygen in the air. So I used argon as a shield gas and it was a mess. This was a terrible idea. And after a little bit more research, it turns out it's because it's completely the wrong approach because I was putting way too much power over much too long of a time on a very small piece. So what I needed was a capacitive discharge welder where you charge up a capacitor bank and then you quickly discharge it. Uh, the problem is uh, a CBD is about a $3,500 device that I knew that I would use a couple of times. Uh, I, did, I called around. I didn't know anybody who actually had one. I looked into actually making one. I know a little bit about capacitors and high voltage. It's a sort of a sideline hobby. Um, but I didn't, um, I didn't really want to design a switch that would be reliable enough within the timings that I needed. It was, just, it was just too much. And besides, I could take advantage of eBay. So are there any drone enthusiasts in the, in the audience? I just want to say personally thank you for making market forces such that I could go onto eBay and find a $100 CVD welder because you need a, a capacitive discharge in order to weld tabs onto the battery terminals on lithium ion packs because you can't solder them because of course you'll you know make a lithium fire if you try to do that so you need a cvd welder so this thing showed up uh from you know mainland china about you know two weeks after i ordered it and i only had to take it apart twice uh the first time i plugged it in it just tripped the breaker like okay something is clearly wrong in here and 
I took it apart, and uh, their method of assembly was really interesting. They had a PC board wedged up against uh, a piece of sheet metal that was just instantly shorting. Like, I don't even know how it was supposed to work in the first place. Like, what, what are you guys doing? So I ordered some parts. I repaired the CVD welder. Uh, so, okay, so to be fair, it was $100 plus, you know, 10 bucks in another week. Uh, but I got it working. So uh, at that point, this little guy has a foot switch and a tiny little uh, anvil I just kind of made. And then, boom, I could, I could spot weld tungsten to tungsten. Okay, great. This is, uh, I, uh, I laser cut out, like this is to scale that little loop of wire with the one millimeter thing on the top, you might remember. So this was my first ever attempt to spot weld, and it, it totally worked and didn't, didn't turn into nasty oxides. So once I had that, I realized that I couldn't just spot weld tungsten wire, I had to spot weld a monocrystal of tungsten. Monocrystal and tungsten is available through different scientific uh, markets, but uh, it's extremely expensive. And it's expensive because it's extremely fragile. Uh, the problem is that a monocrystal is brittle. So you can make monocrystal and tungsten, and you need a monocrystal, let me just take a step back. Uh, tungsten wire, you can get it on eBay all day long because people make old-fashioned light bulbs out of it. And the way that they make it is they center tungsten powder. So you heat up tungsten powder, you force it through a die, and so you end up with this kind of like packed granule kind of structure. It's not a single crystal, it's, it's lots and lots of little tiny grains all pointed in different directions. So if you try to etch that, you're going to end up with a point that's lots of little granules and little, you know, little tiny points. It's not going to work. So I found a paper online for, uh, generate, for creating your own monocrystal and tungsten in the lab. So what this is, uh, this is a piece of uh, Pyrex tubing uh, that you use for, like in a chem lab, for making drains out of. It's, it's basically a piece of tubing with gaskets on either side. So O-rings. Got a piece of uh, uh, aluminum on the top and the bottom. I drilled a couple holes and put spark plugs inside. And uh, it's important if you're gonna do this at home, if you wanna make one of these, uh, there are two kinds of spark plugs, those with the EMF uh, limiting resistors in them and those without. And we're all in the state supposed to be using the EMF limiting resistors. Like take those, like you can either remove the resistors or you can find, uh, you know, from India basically. Uh, yeah, no, uh, no resistor plugs. So do that, uh, hook up a variac and away you go. You make effectively a great big light bulb you hang a weight on the bottom of it. You turn the current up until it's nice and orange. And then you let it sit for a couple of hours. And slowly, that, that polycrystalline tungsten will melt and relax. And then uh, there you go. You got your, you got your monocrystal. Uh, so you take it out of there. And what you end up with is two very sharp, very thin pieces of very brittle tungsten that the first time you pick it up, it's going to break and fall onto the ground. And you're never going to see it again. Uh, so then you make another one. and. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, then you got your monocrystal. So after I did that, uh, this is kind of what I ended up with. Um, rather than trying to make one of these from scratch, this is part of my problem. This little uh, ceramic base, this is the only one that I have. It's the, you know, it's the, wor the working one. Uh, and I didn't um, have it together to try to make one of these yet. That's kind of a, a back burner project at this point. Uh, but instead of trying to make the loop, what I ended up doing was, this is the original emitter, and I, and I picked off the, the, the little tiny point and then I spot welded uh, my, my thing on there. So I just sort of recycled it. So uh, once you've got that, uh, this is a, a picture of a spot weld that I did before I removed the, uh, the emitter. So this is with the old broken emitter. Uh, this is a piece of polycrystalline tungsten spot welded to a monocrystal. And so I could inspect the, the weld and it's, it was quite good. I got good wetting. Um, so I knew I was on the right track. Um, so then how do you make it even sharper. A tenth of a millimeter is nowhere near five orders of magnitude off, six orders of magnitude off. So how are you going to get it sharp? Uh, there were lo lots of people suggested different methods for making it sharp. Some people said just cut it with a sharp pair of tweezers or you know, sharp pair of pliers. That's sharp, I mean, it's sharp enough to go into your finger, but that's, it makes it worse than, uh, than when you started because uh, cutters will, will spread the edge. So it, you know, it looks kind of flat. Uh, you can, somebody suggested pulling it. Just take it and pull it really fast. And while that's true, you know, you can get a pinch. You can't, I did a bunch of experiments and you can't get it reliably to a point. And even then you're still off by about 10,000 times. Um, so uh, the method that I found that works really well is to electro etch it in lye. So uh, you make about a three molar solution of uh, NaOH of, of lye. You, uh, this is just a screw. Uh, we've got my little popsicle stick here in you know, a little loop in the, in the point. 
uh, I just screw the screw down until there's, you know, about two millimeters or so of tungsten hanging down into the bottom of the solution. And then you pass a current through it. So you're passing a current through the point into the solution. You get a sacrificial anode of, uh, or sorry, sacrificial cathode of uh, uh, carbon uh, inside the solution. And I found this method. Um, uh, fortunately, there was at least one paper that wasn't behind a paywall. That uh, uh, this is a thesis from uh, Anna Sophie Lucier from 2004, and uh, she was writing about, uh, you know, she's a grad student, and they have similar problems to me. They have no budget. Uh, so <laughs> they uh, need to make um, uh, tungsten points for various different kinds of, uh, of machinery, not necessarily for an SEM, but I thought that the method might be applicable, and it totally was. Uh, so the, the, the physical thing that's happening here is when you pass a current, this represents the piece of tungsten, and then this is the top of the solution and there's a meniscus and the meniscus wicks up the sides of the tungsten. As you start to pass current through it, it will preferentially etch at the meniscus. That's where all of the action is happening. So as it continues, it forms this kind of a, like an hourglass shape and it's incredible. You can watch it as the current is passing through it. It just gets thinner and thinner and thinner. It's bubbling and you can see it getting really, really thin. And then eventually at some point it becomes so thin that it breaks. And in that instant that it breaks, you have atomically thin tungsten on both of these. In fact, some people design special little catchers in the bottom in order to preserve the second point so you can make twice as many of them. I didn't think it was really that necessary. Uh, I just made more, but uh, uh, it's really wild to watch this thing, uh, this thing work. Um, so the first time I tried to do that, this is what I got. I'm off by about an order of 10 to the fifth, I think. Yeah, it's, I mean, that's clearly like a two micron point. This is the end of that monocrystal, and it's nice and round, and uh, well, what, what did I do wrong? Well, what I did wrong is that when this drop-off happens, I said at the instant that it breaks, you have a monocrystal, but then in the very next instant, you're continuing the etching process. So the longer that the current is applied, the rounder and rounder this point is gonna get, which actually makes an argument for making the catcher because this one stops etching because there's no current. Uh, but luckily, the timings aren't really that bad. You really just need to turn off the current within you know, a couple of hundred nanoseconds or something. <laughs> but fortunately, a 555 timer uh, will do that job for you if you make your uh, selections of RCs carefully enough. So that's exactly what I did. This is uh, from another uh, paper on uh, manufacturing sharp, pointy bits of tungsten. Uh, this one was from uh, 2000. Uh, so uh, all this thing is, I mean, I, you know, I wired this thing up in, you know, an hour in my shop. I mean, it's a 555 timer, a couple of resistors, and a well-chosen capacitor. And what you end up with is a circuit that you can apply, you know, anywhere from 5 to, you know, let's say 30 volts DC. And the secret sauce in why these things cost $5,000 and are a well-guarded industrial secret are in, specifically, in the, cho the choice of voltages and timings and concentrations of sodium hydroxide. So... All I had to do was, you know, iterate on that a little bit, and uh, and there you go. So this was one of my next experiments. It's much sharper. Uh, if we zoom in on that a little, uh, we can see now we're 10,000 x, so we're much less than a micron. And keep in mind, this is still with the old uh, emitter, so I couldn't get really good focus at this point because the emitter was dying as I was trying to, you know, trying to do this. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, at 50,000 X, we, this is about the best I could go. And, I, and I'm estimating I'm probably at about 10 nanometers or maybe smaller, which is within an order of magnitude, right? Like, I'm like, like maybe, maybe two orders of magnitude. I'm getting really close. So here's the problem with the chicken and the egg now. Like, I want to make one. I want to inspect it and make sure that it is correct. And then I want to install it, and I can't. So I just went for it, and I guessed, you know? Like, I, I, I did it. I made a couple. They looked like I had a process. And so... Uh, 48 hours later, uh, and it's 48 hours because you remember that ultra high vacuum I mentioned before. So once you have cracked the top off of this microscope, you need to, okay, do your etch, clean it off. How do you clean atomically thin? It's, I, I, I'm not even going to get into it, but you, you know, there can't be anything on it. Uh, and then you reassemble it, and then you realign it because the top of that venelt has a little hole in it, and that hole has to be perfectly aligned with the center of the... Okay, so I do all that optically, and I hope that it's good enough. And then I, I don't exactly have a procedure for this. I'm just making it up, right? So, uh, so then you reinstall it, you bolt it all down, 
and then you heat the whole thing up. It's, it's a, the whole microscope is uh, wrapped in nichrome wire. So you pass a current through that, and you get it to a couple hundred degrees, you bake it. Uh, I sleep over because I don't trust that the scope is not gonna burn my shop down while I'm at home, so I'm sleeping on the couch. And then uh, the next day, uh, you cool it. And because Boyle's Law, we got PVNRT, uh, after the vacuum system has removed enough of the intervening material when it's hot, as it cools, the pressure drops down because you're maintaining volume. So if you're lucky and you don't have any breaks in your copper gasket, uh, you will get a very, very, very sharp pull down to uh, UHV. So then you can turn the machine on and see if you get a spot. And hopefully you do, because otherwise you get to repeat all of that. And uh, I got really lucky, and uh, it turns out that it worked. So thank you. So. So you'll, you'll notice that this is a very different kind of, kind of thing. Like this almost looks like math. I look at this and I think this is like abstract, you know? I mean, this is, this is a beautiful Bezier curve, right? No, this is, this is electro etch machine tungsten. Like someone made this. This is the original emitter. So when I had, uh, remember I told you I recycled the little loop and I popped off the old emitter. I put it on a tab because I wanted to be able to inspect it. And uh, it looks like it goes down into infinity, right? Like it goes down here, down here, down here, and then boop. Like, there's nothing. Uh, and, I mean, at this point, we're at 10 micro. If this is a 10 micron line, like, you're already smaller than light will let you see. I mean, like, even if you had a good optical scope, you couldn't see the tip. There, there's no way. Not with light. Uh, so if we zoom down with electrons, there's your problem. <laughs> That's what all this was about. This was about a, you know, it's a, about a micron chunk of random gunk and... Uh, uh, those, that, that's, uh, so inside the, the vacuum system, even though it's as clean as you can make it, there's still random crap that floats around. You know, you're, you're hitting an organic sample with an electron beam and bits of it fly off and eventually it finds its way up the beam and then attaches itself to the emitter. And then you have to cook the emitter in order to get that crap back off of it. That's why these FEGs are finicky because there's this constant interplay between keeping the tip clean and using the tip to image. So this represents random junk, bits of uh, 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 tungsten atoms that have migrated downward over time, you know, and it looks like a little bullfrog on the end of your thing that's supposed to be atomically thin. So now I have a new emitter, okay, great. So I went kind of nuts this last uh, six months <laughs> taking pictures and now I have a bunch of them blown up and hanging up on the wall. So that's what I wanted to make the, uh, the rest of the talk about. I guess I'm uh, doing pretty good on time. Uh, so I'm going to just talk about like stuff we took pictures of uh, from here on out. So before I go on, are there any technical questions about the manufacturer? Yes. Uh, is the old system just like the same process with your monster that you want to actually generate it to recycle that tip and make it pointy? Yes, yes. Very, very good question. Is it possible to recycle this tip and make it pointy again? Uh, not with the meniscus method, unfortunately, because part of the component of making that drop happen is that you have a couple of millimeters of tungsten hanging below the meniscus, and there's just not enough material here. You know, the, the, the popsicle stick is too short, so it's already about a millimeter, and I don't know how the hell you could, I mean, maybe you could get a half a millimeter down. No, I don't think you could. I think the meniscus is probably bigger than a half a millimeter even, so I don't think that you have enough hanging down to make the pinch happen, um, unfortunately. I guess you could start longer. I mean, there's no reason why you couldn't start with a longer tip and then, you know, slowly etch your way down. It'd, sa it'd save you a weld. Yes, uh, the question is how, how sensitive is the tip length? Uh, the critical dimension is that the top of the tip must be quite near to the end of the venelt. So as long as you can move the rest of that module up and down, I don't see why you couldn't have a long one and then slowly make it shorter and shorter like a candle. Uh, but uh, I did not do that this time. Uh, <laughs> I, I was trying to go for something as close as possible to the original because I had no idea if it would even work. <laughs> yes? Ah, yes, good question. The trigger for when to stop with the 555. Uh, so uh, I didn't point it out earlier, but uh, the 555 senses changes in current through the circuit. So it has its own trigger. You have a little potentiometer that you can pick. So uh, I just chose a voltage that, I, I chose a position that made it close, as close to the drop off as I could see, and then I looked at a few under the microscope. And then once I saw where it was close enough, that's where I left the potentiometer set. So yeah, you, you hit a button to turn it on and then it turns off automatically. What does the end of your new tip look like? What does the end of the new tip look like? I wish I could tell you, <laughs> because unfortunately it's not possible to uh, image it with uh, its 
itself. Uh, I am now, now that it's been another year since I did this, it's time to make another one. So after tour camp now, I'm going to go home and make another one and pull the old tip off and yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do this again. <laughs> so the curve is proportionate to the density of the, the lie because of the meniscus? Uh, the cur ah, I, I, I see what you're getting at, but uh, to a degree, yes, uh, the, the, the curvature is, is proportional to, but it's, it's, it's more than just the concentration of the lie. It's the, it's the chosen um, uh, etching voltage is way more important. Uh, in fact, this first, this first tip that I showed you here, uh, you might notice that there's, there's two curves here. There's this curve, and then it gets a lot sharper. And that's because I didn't know which input voltage to use. I was just guessing. And this was taking way too long. And I was like, okay. <laughs> this is like, it was, this was at 12 volts, I think. And I'm like, well, it's just, it's going and going. I'm just going to crank it up to 15. And as soon as I did it, whoop, it was done. So I think the voltage has way more to do. Yes? Is three molar strong or moderate? Fairly strong, wouldn't want to get it in your eye. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, I, I, it's a good question. I, I don't know. Um, if uh, I, at first I chose I chose one molar and it didn't really seem to do much, and three molars seemed to be plenty active, and I didn't go past that. Yes. How do you direct the tip once you reinstall it? How do you direct? Spot molded this. Yes. Ah, ah, yes. The question is, how do you direct? How do you position it once you've installed it? Uh, the module itself. Uh, this whole thing sits in a small holder that has set screws that you can finely position. So yeah, you move the whole base. The tip, the tip is where the tip is, and you hope it's straight up because you can't do anything about that. Yes. What are the methods that they use to make it, which are hacky, like which are? <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a very good question. I think it's a refinement of this process, but I haven't been able to find that out. I I don't I don't really know. Uh, as far as I can tell, it's a it's a fairly well-protected industrial secret. Uh, people generally don't make their own FEG tips. And uh, when they come from the manufacturer, typically what you're supposed to do is have a, 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 an arrangement with the manufacturer and they come out and service the machine. So they don't have any incentive to have an aftermarket for, for components. Yes? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, the question is, how do you know it's a monocrystal? Uh, you can see the difference in imaging. Uh, I think I have a picture. Uh, this, uh, no, actually, I don't really. Uh, well, you can almost sort of see it here. Uh, you do it through inspection. I don't have another way to do it except to look at it under the microscope. Uh, but um, the region out here, it's kind of hard to see. I know uh, it looks a little bit more granular. But by the time you get out here, it gets a, it gets a lot smoother. And you can see the difference between this kind of rough, even though it's blurry, versus, versus this. This is a very good monocrystal. I do not yet know if I have achieved a very good monocrystal, but I know that in the different samples that I've made, I have had better and worse examples of it. And you can really tell by uh, the, the, just by the way that it breaks when you, when you, when you pull on it, um, the monocrystal is extremely brittle, and other bits of it are not as. Uh, I don't know how to describe it otherwise. Yeah, one more. Uh, similar I I did it under vacuum and I had no trouble. Because I, I stumbled on the same paper they suggested high vacuum, but I don't uh -huh. have high vacuum in the kitchen. Ah, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so for high vacuum, uh, I was probably only at about 10 to the minus 4-ish, I would say. Yep, that, yep. Oh, so you think that, that would actually That's exactly what I used. Yeah, I used a roughing pump with large gaskets. And, uh, so I, I, I think I was having problems with mine, so I think you, you had an awesome idea with hanging it by that. Yeah, the weight, the weight makes a big difference. I, uh, I was uh, spending a lot of time with tweezers under a microscope trying to tie it between two electrodes. And ah. Yep. Yeah. 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 I, I think I think ten to the minus four minus five seems to be plenty for it. Um, like I let it glow for a couple of hours, and then I crank the voltage until it broke. Yeah, most of my terrible light bulbs have made it about twenty minutes or so before they finally give out. You see, Forget the argon. You have insufficient vacuum. That that's your problem. Work on your vacuum system. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, I'm uh, going to move on to the some of the imagery now, and we'll see if there's more time for questions at the end. Uh, I wanted to start with something that I thought that uh, you all would appreciate. Uh, this is uh, the insides of a YubiKey uh, security key. Uh, this is not the YubiKey. This just, I wanted to give you a sense of scale because the, pro the problem with imagery is you're going to be constantly lost here. So unless you know what the scale is, you have no idea what you're looking at. This is a bond wire pad. So I see some people nodding. If you've ever tried to look at a bond wire pad, they're too small to see with your eye, right? Like you need some magnification. They're really, really tiny. This is the pad. So everything that we're going to look at now is about 5,000 times or 10,000 times smaller than this pad, which is the thing that you can barely see. OK, just to, just to be clear. So this is what happens if you dissolve a YubiKey in strong acid. Uh, they don't like people like me trying to do this kind of thing. <laughs> And they, uh, there is a whole shielding layer that's uh, on top of the actual circuitry. So what we're looking at is the discarded remnants of this tattered tapestry of RF and optical shielding to prevent you from looking at and reverse engineering the, the stuff underneath. Uh, this was our, our first attempt at ever doing this. We didn't make a serious RE attempt. This was just like, hey, you know, can we do it? Uh, so once you scrape that crap out of the way, um, you can see individual circuits. Um, I, uh, I'm not a circuit designer, so I don't know what I'm looking at, but I know it looks capacitive and really interesting. It's storing some state there. I, I don't know. But there's banks and banks and banks of this stuff. Let me tell you, it goes on like Tron for miles. Uh, so this is a 10,000x. Uh, once you scrape that top surface away, these are like bus bars. I don't know. I don't know how else to describe it, but this is like power distribution. So the actual circuits sit on top of this and interconnect different pieces, and some of them are very clearly, you know, plus and minus, but I don't know, it just looks like really cool wallpaper. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Um, polysilicon. Uh, yeah, so man-made stuff looks really geometric, and now I'm going to give you the insect alert. So if you are at any way, you know, triggered by uh, disturbing pictures of insects, now is your chance to close your eyes, because here's a spider. <laughs> so... Uh, this guy, uh, he's smiling at you and look it up. This is an optical picture. This is not the SEM. Uh, it was Christmas Day, and I had gone and gotten a Christmas tree. And uh, it was a cute little tree, but I noticed it was kind of dry that year. I don't know why. We just couldn't really keep it alive. But you know, we're going to a Christmas party, and, and my wife, Phoebe, says, hey, what's that on your hair? And there's a little spider. I'm like, oh, that's, that's weird. Uh, yeah, we came home from the Christmas party, and the tree had hatched, and there were <laughs> spiders all over the apartment. But they were babies. I don't know that. I don't know. Okay, I, I'm also going to say I'm not a biologist. I'm not a taxonomist. I'm, I'm talking about a whole lot of things I don't know anything about, but I can take pictures of them. So these are <laughs> these are little bitty baby spiders. And uh, so this guy, this is actually a focus stack of 20 images. He's only about I'd put him at about a millimeter and a half tall. So very very small. And uh, I was impressed at how liquid they are. Uh, you know, when they're, when they're babies especially, they're like little bags of jelly uh, covered in hairs. That's the best that I could do looking at it under an optical scope. Any more than that, and you, you really couldn't see it. So here's your SEM of uh, happy smiling. Spider, it's kind of dark in here. Yeah, I'm sorry, I apologize for the glare. But uh, this guy, uh, here, I'll go back one. You can see he's got like one, two, three, four, five, six, little, seven, eight little eyes. And you could zoom in on each one of those guys. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight little eyes. Uh, this uh, scale, this is at about 2,000x or so, I would say. Uh, but you know, each individual hair has lots of little barbs on it. And like, here's a leg. Like, check out those barbs. Those barbs are on the nanometer scale. <laughs> like, these guys operate in a completely different physical universe than you and I are used to, um, you know, interacting in. Could I train them to do my? <laughs> That's an excellent suggestion. I, I think I need a spider army of uh, minions, possibly. Um, so uh, if spiders don't uh, squick you out enough, uh, here's a mosquito. Uh, so mosquitoes have a very different kind of, you know, kind of like if if spiders are like the serial killers of the insect world, like these guys are just, I don't know, they're like the berserker, <laughs> you know. Like, the, you know, so here's dozens of eyes, right, with little tiny hairs in between the eyes. And the whole thing is very hairy. This is the proboscis here. Uh, these were the first couple of images that I took with the new emitter. I was still kind of getting the hang of it. Um, so, uh, 
So I'm going to move on to this, and I wish I had taken a, a better picture of what this actually is. This is another optical picture. It's another focus stack. It's like another dozen pictures or something, so it's, it's quite small. This is a moth's head, and specifically, this is the dividing line in the middle of the head, and this is one eye. So a moth has compound eyes. It has two large sort of hemisphere kind of globes of eyes, and I was amazed at what, what, what happened uh, next with this, because I knew that a compound eye has many cells, and you know each cell... Uh, interacts with the light in interesting ways uh, because each one is like a little part of a honeycomb. Every one of these little dots is like a part of a honeycomb. So, like a radio, like a radio telescope array. That is, keep that in mind as we continue down the, the rabbit hole here. Yes, it's a lot like an array of uh, antennas. Uh, I just didn't realize how much. So if we start with this little, this little box here, this is gonna be this. So we just zoomed in many thousand times. And here are your individual, you know, honeycomb. Got your hexagons. And well, the first thing that I noticed when I got down uh, at this level is I can't focus on it. It's the weirdest thing. And like, I'm not even going to get into the issues of focusing in FEG. Uh, we can talk <laughs> offline about how this is not a camera. This is an interactive uh, performance art display <laughs> of a human being desperately trying to make a, an electron beam interact with a surface. It is not photography. It is something else entirely. Uh, it's a lot of fun if you ever want to come down to the shop. But I could not focus. Um, I could focus on this stuff. You can see this is perfectly sharp. Here's a little hair. Those are disturbing between the cells. Uh, <laughs> lots of random debris and crap. But the, 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 the hexes themselves, I could not focus on. And it could be because the, you know, the sample is holding too much charge is generally the problem. And you know, because the beam um, interferes with itself. You have a negative beam shooting onto a surface that holds a negative charge. You can't hit it. It's going to deflect the beam. But that wasn't it. it. I just couldn't focus on it. So if we take this square, and we're going to go down onto that now, here's what I saw. So I was not expecting this. I thought it would be a surface of a cell. And what it was, it, it has lots of little cells. Like, okay, well, that's interesting. I know nothing about insects, but wow, this is really weird. It's like an array of little antennas. So we're, now we're at 10,000 X. So this line represents one micron, which, yeah, I mean, you, you breathe 10 micron particles and don't even notice it. So these are very small. And so that's clearly much smaller than that. Uh, I wanted to point out that these pictures are actually much larger than the screen will let you see. These are 13 megapixel images each. So if we don't even zoom anymore, I'm just going to upscale here so you can see the same number of pixels. Here's what we're looking at. So here's your one micron line, 10,000 X. This stuff over here, I've seen enough stuff to tell you that this is probably grass pollen. It had a little, little pollen in its eye. Uh, but uh, these little things were intriguing. So to get down further magnification to get uh, you know sharper, what we're going to do is I'm going to take this little square and we're going to go in. But uh, one thing that you constantly do with a scanning electron microscope is you're sacrificing resolution for zoom. Because the faster you can scan, the deeper you can go because the less energy you're putting on the sample. But if you try to go slow, you're depositing overall more, uh, more charge onto the sample. So when you go faster, you can go deeper, but the resolution's not going to be as good. So just forewarned, there it is. So now we're at about NTSC resolution. This isn't 13 megapixel anymore. This is all the, that's all the dots. But you can see this is a 100 nanometer line. We're at 65,000 X down here. And these are tiny little hairs on the tiny little cells on the tiny little head. Uh, so we could just go one more just for the fun of it. So if we take that and we go down. Now we're at 200,000 X. So we're looking at hairs that are probably maybe 100 nanometers long, maybe 20 nanometers across, and each of those hairs is still smaller than the smallest dye that we know how to manufacture for a single hair on a single cell, on a single eye of a... It's a universe is what I'm trying to get through to you people. Like, I, I don't know how to express how bizarre the sense of scale through the universe is, because like, it, it blew my mind the first time that I had this scope and I figured out how to use it, and I start like zooming down and zooming down and zooming down and focusing, and uh, keeping the whole thing quiet and level and turning off the fans and turning off the music and waiting for the trains out back to go away because the slightest breath is going to make the screen do this, you know? And you do that for hours in the dark, staring at the screen, and then like, you, okay, I'm done, and you step outside, you look up, and then there are the stars. And,
I just broke my brain a little bit, and I think I liked it. <laughs> so, yes, so this was the, the moth eye. Uh, and if you want to see DNA, you've still got to go quite a bit deeper. Uh, DNA, we're talking about two nanometers in diameter, about a third of a nanometer between the bases, or, you know, roughly on the order of the size of the probe that had to be manufactured to show you this picture. Can moths see ultraviolet? Now, here's the thing. I'm, I'm not, I, I'm just, I know nothing about insects, so I don't know how to answer your question, but I strongly suspect that there's not an optical thing going on here. We are sub, sub. Uh, like even even UV, so like they're going to be seeing some crazy interference patterns. Ten ten to four hundred nanometers. So each hair is okay. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, maybe they're into UV. Yeah, I I don't know, but there's going to be something strange going on in their brain with individual hairs lighting up as quantum effects are happening on the surface of their eyeball. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, sorry, that's the wrong one. There we go. So let's, uh, while I have a few minutes left, yeah, I got a few minutes left. Uh, any guesses at what kind of creature this would, this, this would be? This, we're back to, is it a blood cell? That's a good question. That's, it looks kind of similar. I'll give, you another, I'll, give, I'll give you another example. There's a, looks like it came out of Star Wars, kind of down in the crack and pit thing. Uh, sorry? Fungus, good. Good question. Is it a spore? Now we're, yeah, we're getting closer. So, like I say, without the scale, you have no idea what we're looking at, right? This actually turns out to be pollen. And what happens with pollen, uh, it's like a little, um, you know, hard case that holds genetic material. And then you go and be really cruel to it and you stick it in a vacuum. And when that happens, it explodes sometimes. So, these are, this is ordinarily pretty smooth. And then this is a, the chunk of it that blew off and flipped over, and, you know, it's the inside of the pollen. But uh, it probably took an hour to figure out what the hell I was looking at. Uh, because you need to know the scale, and you need to know what you think you put in there, and then there's a very good chance that you're just looking at random contamination on the stub, which is only, you know, five millimeters across to begin with anyway. Um, but it does look really neat. Like, there's some kind of crystalline thing going on down here. I don't even know what it is. This is probably a spore, because there were mushroom spores on the same sample. And that's about the right size. I was amazed at how much mushroom spores, at least this specific uh, species of mushroom, uh, look like white blood cells. They're, they're red blood cells, excuse me. They're, they're about the right shape and size. Uh, here's uh, some unbroken pieces of that same pollen. Uh, they just like, you know, that is no moon kind of thing. Uh, so here's another piece. Uh, so this uh, came from a tree. I don't know what kind of tree. I was just walking along in the neighborhood and collected some pollen. Uh, this is um, a very regular kind of geometric shape. I love the baby pollen. It looks like a little raspberry or something. I don't know. It's 100 times smaller than the piece of pollen that contains all the genetic material for the tree. Uh, and, then, uh, and then finally, I'm going to end on, on this guy, which is another piece of the same kind of tree pollen. Um, the stuff on the top and bottom, uh, the way that I collected this pollen, there were, uh, it was like a husk that had a whole bunch of pollen in it. And so the brown kind of husk material where the, where the pollen comes out of, that's what the top and bottom is. And uh, so there were, you know, thousands of pieces of pollen inside of, I mean, I, scale is relative. So what can I say? It was too small to see. Uh, and so that's little bits of husk holding it together wherever the pollen came from. So now I sound like a babbling idiot because, like I say, I don't know what I'm looking at. I, I, I made a probe <laughs> that can show you this stuff. Uh, it's a lot of fun to take pictures of it. And uh, I'm based in Seattle. Uh, so if uh, any of you all have things you would like to see on a very, very, very deep magnification scope, please bring them by and we would be happy to take pictures. Um, that's all I got. So uh, any more questions uh, before we... Wrap it up. Yep. How did you diagnose that your emitter was bad? How did I diagnose that the emitter was bad? Uh, there is a, you get a sense of beam stability when you are taking images. Here's what happens. There's a, there's a curve that happens. You do this thing called flashing the emitter. You hit a button. The button passes current through that loop. That gets the emitter hot. And when you do that, it ejects all of the crap that's on the, emitter, the end of the emitter off. Then you let it cool, and you can image with it for hours. It's rock solid and stable. And then eventually, you get more crap on the end of the emitter, and then you have to flash it again. And usually, you can go like you know a day or two without having to flash it. 
uh, as it starts to break down, that time gets shorter and shorter. And then eventually you cannot maintain a stable beam. And it's really heartbreaking because you'll, you'll be down there, you'll be zoomed all the way in, everything is great. And you go to take a slow scan photo and you'll get varying levels of brightness uh, as the emitter intensity is wavering. So that's how you know it's, it's starting to go. And that's where I'm at now, so I'm gonna make another one. <laughs> Yes? How do you get stuff in without breaking the vacuum? Ah, how do you get stuff in without breaking the vacuum? Good question. We have an airlock. And in fact, I have right here. There we go. There it is. This guy actually has two airlocks. Uh, so uh, there is a gradation of vacuum. You get 10 to the minus nine here, we've got 10 to the minus six here, separated by a physical valve, and then you have 10 to the minus five-ish down here. Inside here, you got a, um, uh, an airlock. So you uh, put your sample on the end of this stick that has a seal. You shove that in here, and it goes through a cycle that it uh, injects some nitrogen to clear out the moisture, and then evacuates all that back out. And then you're at 10 to the minus 4 behind the seal. You stick it in there, and then reverse to, uh, to pull it back out again. And uh, this guy was actually, he actually has two airlocks because this was originally intended to be a, an inspection scope for Seagate. So they manufactured um, silicon. So like this guy, I'll take a whole silicon wafer in the side and you can go and inspect it. But I don't know why you would do that because a single, like a single circuit on, on a silicon wafer would take me months to properly analyze, let alone hundreds on a wafer. Like I don't even, I'm not in silicon manufacturer, so I don't know how they used it. But yeah, they were into looking at lots of things. Any other questions? Oh, one more? Thoughts on desktop SEMs? We should talk offline. <laughs> Completely different beast. All right, thanks, everybody.